Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast, your on-the-go source for radiology education with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at RadRevPodcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website theradiologyreview.com. Welcome to this bonus episode of the Radiology Review Podcast. In this episode, I interview Dr. Michael R. Jackson, who is a consultant pediatric radiologist at the Royal Hospital for Children and Young People in Edinburgh, Scotland. Dr. Jackson's many accomplishments include being the trustee of the British Society for the History of Radiology and archivist to the Scottish Radiological Society. I interview Dr. Jackson to discuss his book, Imagining Imaging, From Rankin to Rembrandt, Hounsfield to Hollywood, and Vesalius to Video Games, Imagining Imaging explores the deeply entwined relationship between art and medical imaging. I was provided a review copy of this book from the publisher. I am not receiving compensation for providing this book review or interview. Topics we discuss include how medical imaging and art often intersect in regards to the ways that they portray the human body. We also discuss some of the history of radiology, the potential future of radiology, including artificial intelligence, and, of course, Dr. Jackson himself and how he came to write this fascinating book. Should you choose to purchase a copy of this book, you can do so at a link provided in the show notes, including a discount code that is active at the time of this episode upload. Without further ado, let's get into the interview with Dr. Jackson on his book, Imagining Imaging. Let's get to know you before we dive into discussing your book. So my first question is, where did you grow up and where did you complete your medical training? I grew up in Cambridge um, in England and um, I, I trained at University College London and then I did house jobs in uh, London as well at the North Middlesex Hospital and then a medical rotation uh, back in Cambridge before embarking on radiology training in Newcastle. Excellent. And what are the main reasons you chose medicine and subsequently radiology? In terms of medicine, uh, I come from a medical family. My mum's a doctor and on my father's side, my aunt and uncle are also doctors. I was actually quite squeamish as a young child um, and so I hadn't really considered it as a major possibility until I was sort of a teenager, really. When I was studying for exams, I was preferentially revising biology and, and sort of the medical uh, dimensions and, and perhaps the anatomy aspects. Uh, you know, preferentially and uh, compared to the other areas and uh, and realised actually, you know, this was something that was uh, of interest to me. The, the combination of interest in biology and, and human anatomy and obviously the, the opportunity to help people uh, was very appealing. Um, and then in terms of radiology, I think I've always enjoyed looking at pictures. The, the mixture of looking at pictures and requiring thorough understanding of the underlying anatomy and pathology to make sense of those images uh, is something that I've, I've found very appealing. I think that was sort of the, the principal draw to, to radiology and also an understanding of, of how pivotal it is in terms of patient management, what opportunity we have to help patients by by making sense of, of what we see on um uh, imaging examinations. And where do you currently work? I work at the Royal Hospital for Children and Young People in Edinburgh. Excellent. Uh, where did your interest in studying art originate from? So I've always enjoyed art in, in terms of doing drawings and paintings um, for, from an early age. Alongside that, have enjoyed looking, as, as I said, I've always enjoyed looking at images uh, into adult life. There's a dimension of uh, trying to understand the nature of what artists are trying to achieve in, in, in their paintings and, and, and that sort of dimension of then looking into things in a bit more detail in, in terms of where, where they use, those images have come from and what's influenced uh, those artists has, has been something mm-hmm. that I've found very interesting. And one question that's very interesting to me, because I've thought about writing a book at various times. In fact, I've actually embarked on that endeavor myself. Between your career and family, how do you find the time necessary to write this book? <laughs> uh, that is a good question, Matt. So 
it was a challenge, if I'm honest, because I had originally envisaged doing it on my day off. I, I don't work on a Monday and thought that uh, while my boys were at school, I would be able to make head, headway with the book over a period of months. And then the pandemic happened. And uh, that meant that uh, when I was at home, uh, mm-hmm. I was engaged in homeschooling um, and, and all the rest of it. And so it did become a little bit of a challenge. And I mean, I know a lot of people in lockdown were, um, you know, did the, it was sort of the classic uh, <laughs> phrase, oh, now, now's your chance to write a book. But uh, obviously, what, what was still juggling full-time work, which uh, had its challenges, as well as the, the homeschooling. So it was a little bit of a juggling act. I think you should be very pleased with the end result. It's a very interesting book. Let's go ahead and dive into some of the sections that I've selected from your book. So the first one is from chapter one. In chapter one, you state, I hope by the end of the chapter, you will consider the representations of the human body acquired with the scientific discipline of medical imaging to also belong to the tradition of artistic representation. My question is, how did you first conceive of and then write a book that resides right at the intersection of medical imaging and art? So I suppose as a, as a radiology trainee, when getting to grips with making sense of these images, uh, I was struck by the, you know, the near infinite range of ways of, of viewing the body um, in, in that sort of setting. And then how we narrow down those options to, to sort of make sense of them in terms of how we interrogate particularly a CT examination. And then I was reading a book, an art history book by E.H. Gombrich, um, The History of Art, where he was talking about the the use of effectively what we as radiologists would call orthogonal views for portraying the body in, in classic ancient Egyptian art. And I was thinking, oh, well, actually, yes, there is a, a real overlap in terms of how we, we get to grips with making sense of these images of the body in, in the, the medical arena and what artists have been doing for, for millennia, really. Going back to the, the CT mm-hmm. and, and the 3D reconstructions, the, the software that we use to look at surface rendered reconstructions were actually developed by Pixar. So it's a, a definite uh, overlap, if you like, in, in the Venn diagrams of sort of art and uh, science in terms of medical imaging. The idea sort of developed from giving a short talk at a, a radiology meeting, uh, touching on some of these aspects, and then that developed into a, a longer talk at the Edinburgh Science Festival. And that was a, a sort of double act with um, one of the artists I feature in the book called Hugh Turvey, who actually did the cover artwork. And then on the basis of that, Colin Sanderson, who runs the Artisans Library based here in Edinburgh, um, approached me and, and uh, thought the talk was quite interesting. And at the time, I was, I was sort of grappling with a very heavy on-call duties because we were quite sort of depleted as a team at the Children's Hospital. And then mm-hmm. since then, we've grown the team a bit and felt like there was a bit more opportunity to uh, get the book written. And it, it did sort of come a little bit by serendipity in that I had been asked to review a book proposal concerning the history of radiology and at the end of the review process, they say, oh, do you have any writing projects of your own? And so I thought, oh, well, I'll take a punt. And then I got into discussions with the publishers and they were enthusiastic. And then as it, once I was sort of committed to writing mm-hmm. the thing, then I thought, well, <laughs> there's no turning back now. <laughs> so uh, that's sort of how it came about. Several examples you give in the book point out that things like woodcuts by the artist Albrecht Durer or depicting human forms on a loom woven fabric are analogous in some ways to CT image formation, given that these all use a slice by slice representation of 3D structures. After reading your book, it really struck me that medical imaging and human art both make conscious decisions about how to represent the body and even sometimes use similar methods. You know, the artist with their artistic medium and the radiologist with a scientific technological medium. Therefore, art and radiology shared its root, the challenge of depicting the human form, and we simply do the best we can with the mediums we have at our uh, disposal. But it's really remarkable, your book has driven home to me, that medical imagers and artists are connected in that way, that we have to make choices about how we're going to look at and depict the human body, and that's really amazing. 
I just wanted to get your thoughts on one thing. One example not in your book that your book did inspire me to consider is that as a nuclear radiologist, we often overlay false coloring of human anatomy for a visual purpose in something like a PET CT. And one can choose rainbow coloring over the body or choose to color the body in various different color schemes that I realized remind me of times of Andy Warhol paintings where he places fantastical, non-realistic, and bright colors over the human form, famous images such as those of Marilyn Monroe depicted with different color schemes. Yet the colors play a very specific role and allow one to perceive the images in new ways. What are your thoughts along that line? That, that's a really interesting question, Matt, and, it, and it's particularly interesting that you mentioned Andy Warhol, actually, um, although I don't um, allude to him in, in the book. And I, and I think thinking about that dimension of, you know, what, what is the real sort of truth that we're, we're trying to display? And, you know, because we'll talk about a f false colour schemes, but, you know, it, it is a sort of a, a legitimate representation of, of the underlying anatomy in, in, in one of the chapters that I sort of... I, sort of get to grips with this sort of difficulty of, of what, what is sort of anatomical truth, if you like, uh, versus this representational aspect. So the in, interesting dimensions in terms of, yeah, you, there's a sort of near limitless scope of how we can potentially, you know, when we are acquiring data sets that uh, ha have sort of nuanced data that we can't necessarily uh, perceive, you know, like a simple example being uh, CT windowing that we, we were obviously having to adjust the setting depending on what specific densities we're interested in uh, interrogating. I sort of use some astronomical images in, in the book, but don't, don't really go into a, a, a major discussion. But this is something that's similar in, in um, images from of, of deep galaxies and nebulae uh, that they'll, they'll often be tinkering with the, the colour schemes yes. to make them sort of most e either aesthetically pleasing or, or, or demonstrating the, the features to human vision uh, as opposed to you know if, if we're getting data that's in infrared uh, format we're talking about color but if you like a gray area <laughs> in terms of uh, what 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 is sort of legitimate versus uh, perhaps accentuating certain features uh, for you know dramatic or aesthetic uh, purposes uh -huh. so it's certainly not isolated to radiology but yeah definitely an interesting area to explore right Moving on into chapter two, you say that we are always sampling the external visual world in a highly incomplete selective fashion. And later you say that the data conveyed via the optic nerve is very much an edited highlights package of the visual information instant on the retina. You go on to really interestingly describe that perhaps of 10 billion bits of information reaching the retina, only 6 million bits will be transferred via the optic nerves and that of these perhaps only 100 bits, again of potentially 10 billion bits, constitutes what we consider conscious perception. Uh, therefore, it would seem we are ignoring or at least unaware of a lot more than we are ever claiming to see and imagining a lot more than we can claim to be observing. And this is one of many very thought-provoking quotes that you've put in your book. After reading this, should we conclude that our own visual perception appears to allow us to only sample at any given moment the smallest subset of the visual information that is available to us? It's interesting, isn't it? It seems highly counterintuitive that there is robust neurophysiological data to, to demonstrate that we, we are seeing things in a, in a very fragmented, selective fashion, sort of adding a lot of additional neurally generated signal to sort of supplement the information that we're, we're receiving via the retina. I, I go on to say in, in that chapter that, you know, the, the fact that you're reading the sentence will, will tell you that actually human vision is pretty good and pretty reliable um, in most situations. But looking at that data, it does suggest, you know, that we're, we're certainly imposing quite a lot of our own ideas, if you like, um, onto what we're seeing. And in, a, in another chapter, we explore that sort of dimension of how, how we're sort of constructing a, a, a sort of version of reality at the same time as we're, we're seeing it. I, I hope it's thought provoking. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not undoing all of radiology <laughs> as a sort of house of cards that falls down <laughs> because of the, the sort of quirks of um, neurophysiology. But for anyone who's in the business of interpreting images, I think it's something that uh, bears consideration. Right. There is a juxtaposition of, on one hand, our visual system is extremely advanced, 
And on the other hand, it's also in any given moment limited. I reflected after reading this chapter that before I lived in Salt Lake City, Utah, where I currently am, I was in St. Louis, Missouri, and they have really quite a good art museum there that has a particularly large Monet painting titled Water Lilies, I think one of many on that theme. And this painting is 13 feet wide. It was actually the centerpiece of three panels on this theme that Monet painted, and the other panels are now located at other art museums. Each time I saw this painting over the course of several years, it really was as if I perceived something new about the colors or something new about the composition that I had not noticed before. And again, there's 13 feet of artistic image to analyze with this painting. And therefore, I now conclude that it's not possible to ever fully perceive the entirety of, of this painting by Monet. The same may also be true for any other complex artistic representation or complex medical imaging study. How then does this translate into our work as a radiologist, where we are tasked to essentially see everything on an image? That's a great question. And, and I think it's something that we, we probably all work in the field of radiology sort of grapple with and scratch our heads over uh, to some extent. Just a, a chest radiograph with just a single image can reveal so many different uh, diagnoses and important information could be sort of hidden away or, or, or hard to spot. So just a single image can require, you know, a great deal of scrutiny, but typically we'll get through them in, 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 a, ma in a matter of, you know, perhaps a, a few seconds or, or minutes or something. Um, and then CTs, as we we're alluding to, the range of manipulation of the windowing and then being able to reconstruct in any plane and then playing around with 3D reconstructions and looking at those from any plane, you could, you know, any single examination could potentially occupy forever. I think, you know, one, one of the jobs of the radiologist is to cut down to the, the most important imaging features, but it is potentially yeah, quite, quite an undertaking that we're um, engaged with. Right. Uh, in your book, you say that radiologists have a tendency to gravitate back to axial images, like a multilingualist reverting to their first language. I think that's extremely true. I believe every radiologist would agree with that statement. What is it about axial images that causes us to continually want to look at the body in that plane? I mean, I guess there's probably the historical dimension of uh, CT examinations originally having been solely acquired in an axial plane. The ability to reformat in any plane is a relatively recent development. Historically, things like atlases of, of CT were largely done in axial format. It's always struck me when I have perhaps a surgeon overlooking my shoulder that they frequently would request to see the body in the coronal plane. I thought it's probably because that more closely mimics the plane they see when they're looking down at the body in the operating room. Nonetheless, radiologists continually still go back to the axial plane. I've wondered if the axial plane possibly focuses our attention more on specific organs and maybe having less information to look at on a single image actually aids us in being able to look at each organ in detail. Do you think there's something to that? I think you, you may be right. So I talk about um, cross-section images having existed ever since the first tree was chopped in half or, or fruit sort of sliced, sliced in half. And, and I guess that, you know, when we think of the mm -hmm. body, that we are kind of cutting in cross-sectional through the, the longest axis. I mean, it's interesting you raised the point of, you know, the, the surgeons being more familiar at looking at it from, you know, the coronal plane. We, we have this um, convention in our department that spinal x-rays performed for the surgeons looking to correct scoliosis for patients uh, a sort of flip left right inverted uh, because that's the projection that they would be more familiar with when operating from the patient's back um, which does occasionally cause confusion but you know it, it sort of reinforces that dimension of how different people will perceive the body in, in different ways depending on what their reference points are. In your book, you say that the act of interpreting just a single image without reference to any previous imaging draws upon an enormous cache of visual references, whether other radiographs, anatomical dissection, diagrams from medical school, or other imaging modalities that help make sense of the anatomy and so forth. And that really struck me that we as radiologists must have visual references of what is normal, and those are more in our subconscious when we search an image, yet allow us to immediately identify in many cases when pathology is present. So I would say our visual search is both conscious and unconscious. 
The image we are looking at right now compared to the references of thousands of images we have seen over prior years of practice that exists somewhere underneath consciousness. This is possibly analogous to Picasso, where there's a story that uh, he gave a sketch to a woman who said, it only took you 30 seconds to draw this little masterpiece. And Picasso responded, my good woman, it took me 30 years to draw that masterpiece in 30 seconds. Your chapter on how we use our visual references that we've developed during training in medical school causes one to consider how a radiologist does perceive an image and how a painter can paint images that are really, you know, even looking at something like Bob Ross, who I'm sure you're familiar with, part of the wonder of watching him work is just how quickly the composition comes together. Yet it's the manifestation of years of training and practice. Yeah, I think it is this dimension of, of deciding what's normal. So I've touched on thinking about the femur, having a sort of notional idea in my head of, of what a normal femur looks like. But then I've, I've mentioned one of the appeals of paediatric radiology is, is this range of, um, you know, from, from babies up to teenagers. So that femur that I've got in my mind as being a normal appearance, obviously, alters considerably according to the age of the patient. And then there's obviously a degree of variability in terms of the trabecular patterning. And, and yeah, so it's quite interesting whether that idea is a, a specific image that I have in, in my mind <laughs> or quite how it works. And then I talk a little bit about um, uh, aphantasia, which is the inability to conjure images in the mind's eye. In the process of writing the book, I, I discovered that one of my colleagues is aphantasic and it, it clearly has no impact on the quality of uh, work that they do and an absolutely top-notch <laughs> radiologist, but uh, th th certainly not conjuring a specific image of a normal brain or bone or wh whatever it is when undertaking the interpretation of the images. So it's definitely interesting in that regard. And then, uh, as I say, in terms of the process of, of how long it takes to accumulate these visual references to, to be able to make sense of them and and likewise the sort of artistic endeavor that's that's um uh, accumulated over a long period of time it's all going on on in there somewhere in those gray cells isn't it but uh, but yeah quite a difficult business to untangle in your book you have many references to both famous artistic works as well as famous film scenes and you talk a lot about how movies are filmed and conscious decisions that the camera workers, in terms of how they may depict the scene in ways that maybe one wouldn't consider at first glance when watching a movie. For example, there's a lot of interesting examples you give where the focus of the camera, whether something is viewed in focus or out of focus, has a very deep impact on human emotion or human perception of the scene. Can you expand a little bit more about how cinema and filmmaking may correspond to what we do in radiology in terms of where our focus is or how we perceive an image? Uh, sure. So, it's, I mean, it's interesting that cinema was sort of invented, if you like, at the same year as x-rays were discovered uh, back in 1895. And I think that the two go together very naturally. We could obviously consider things like um, fluoroscopy to effectively be a movie of sorts, just in, in, in a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And, and I think in, in terms of that dimension, then the kind of framing, if you like, of shots is very readily understandable as being akin to a, a sort of movie director and that when we take, you know, frontal view or a lateral view, these are very similar to different directorial decisions about, about where to film the action from in a movie. And and then likewise, the use of uh, collimation um, in, in terms of how the image is framed has some similarities to, to different sort of aspect ratio in different movies. The element you touched on in, in regard to the use of focus, I think is, is quite an interesting area because we would expect in, in, in radiology you, that we want everything to be perfect. You know, the, the, this idea that we're seeing the anatomy as it is and perfectly in focus. But then actually the element, so making the comparison with using focus to either direct the audience's attention in movies, and then sometimes the image is deliberately out of focus to, to convey a character's emotion. I, I sort of use the example of The Graduate, where Elaine, Mrs. Robinson's daughter, is out of focus and then brought into focus uh, very slowly as, as, as the penny drops that her mum's been having an affair with Dustin Hoffman. 
And likewise, in medical images, uh, we're not sort of deliberately <laughs> making things out of focus, but then there are things within the images which, you know, perhaps arguably shouldn't be there, wh whether that's sort of acoustic shadowing related to either renal or, or gallstones, but which actually is, is quite a helpful feature in, in looking for those things. And then likewise, susceptibility weighted imaging in MRI having sort of developed from something that is often a, a nuisance in, in terms of it certainly in, in children we're often getting either sort of dental braces causing a big black hole in the, their face or in, in the book I use an example where a child had swallowed a coin and tended for an abdominal scan and, and it's just a, a big black hole in, in most of the abdomen whereas used appropriately we can can use that artifact to, to actually help reveal you know, subtle areas of, of microhemorrhage or, or calcification in the brain. So th this kind of philosophical dimension of what should and should not be within the image is is something that I, I find quite interesting. And, and yeah, I'd use various examples from cinema, uh, another one being lens flare, which historically was always something that cinematographers took great pains to avoid uh, being in shot. And then Conrad Hall in, I think, uh, Cool Hand, Luke um, sort of deliberately made use of it. And then ever since then, it's been visible in lots of movies and then deliberately sort of engineered in, in sort of CGI type movies, including Star Wars. And then now in, in video games, we see lens flare sort of deliberately added in to sort of give authenticity to the images when it's it's you know just a fabricated thing that shouldn't really be there at all but i found that area quite interesting to put these images under the microscope and and have a have a, a think about what should be in the image and what shouldn't be and it, and it gets a little bit more complicated than you might first suppose I appreciated all of the many film references you mentioned in the book because it really does make it a very interesting and enjoyable read. I don't want the readers to get the false impression that the book is primarily about how radiologists interpret images because in reality, much of the book is explaining the history of art and cinema and how they make conscious choices and how to depict the scene to the viewer. It's really masterfully done. So I, I congratulate you on how you've interwoven very interesting examples from art, from cinema, and from the science of medical imaging together in what's really an enjoyable whole. Towards the end of your book, and it's a very logical conclusion that you say, much of art history can be summarized as the process by which new generations of artists build or modify pre-existing visual templates. You start in the book in antiquity, talking about some of the first images of which we're aware, things like cave art, where the human form is depicted. And you can trace from there going forward to our current artistic representations of the human body. And you can see there is a connection between what humans have done for tens of thousands of years in terms of depicting the body. Although the images change over time, there are certain themes that have just simply stuck. You say that a radiologist is also, in a way, tied to our scientific historical past, but that we need to have a willingness, and I love this phrase, to tune into new radio stations as well as the tried and tested ones. When I read that, I just said in my mind, yes, that is exactly right. We need to have a willingness to tune into the new radio stations while still respecting the tried and tested ones. So my question for you is, how do we continue what is good from our past, but also at the same time not be so committed to our past that we neglect to imagine imaging in completely new ways? That's a really challenging question, Matt. There are elements of the story of radiology mm -hmm. which are those of undoubted progress and phenomenal improvement in terms of the quality of the images, the safety of imaging examinations. We think about how radiation doses have come down, both in, in plain film technology, but also uh, CT and, and other areas. So generally, we, we are, you know, what feels like a sort of a, a progressive story of, of improvement and success. Alongside that, I think we also have to contextualise how imaging is used in the big picture. In 
adult uh, radiology, we're finding that imaging is getting very sophisticated, but th there's a, perhaps a little bit of a law of diminishing returns that we've sort of got very high end scanners used predominantly in oncology and, and cardiovascular disease. The gains that the patients get from those they may, may, you know, on an individual basis may be very significant, but sort of opening up the consideration to a more sort of population level looking at the dimension of prevention of disease may be a more useful um, use of resources than coming up with increasingly sophisticated imaging with marginal gains to patient care. And particularly in the context of the climate crisis, we have to raise concerns about the energy consumption of medical imaging. For those situations where it's life-saving imaging in, in an acute setting, um, then that, that's good use of resources. But if we're using lots of energy and resources to, to try and sort of ameliorate diseases, which we know how to prevent, then this needs to come under increasing scrutiny. Right. Your final chapters of the book really focus on our potential future medical imaging and raise many interesting points in terms of how do we best apply our images to make sure that we have just the right amount of imaging available to make a confident diagnosis, striking a balance where we're not doing too much. And you say in there that one of the hardest decisions a radiologist has to make is when have we done enough imaging? I think that was something that really caused me to stop and reflect. Do we always need to go on and do the more advanced test to prove in maybe a second way what we already are suspecting based on you know the tests we already have at hand? I believe you also say in your book that one of the hardest things for a radiologist to say is to call something normal. Can you expand a little bit more on those thoughts? Certainly. So I think whenever we provide a radiology report, uh, we've always got that lingering doubt in our minds that uh, an error or a miss might come back to haunt us. Worse, obviously, if it potentially harms the patient. And so signing off reports as normal can often be the, the more challenging thing to do. And whether we have a, a tendency and you know, that there can be an inclination to be, perhaps be a bit defensive, you know, a, a legitimate concern in relation to you know, the patient's welfare, but also perhaps informed by fear of litigation, that we, we may tend to over-investigate perhaps, whether it's a follow-up scan or a different type of scan. There's sort of been this tendency, you know, as, as more modalities are available, then it's very tempting to make use of them, that we can kind of always come up with some justification to do so on the basis that it will give a higher level of certainty it definitely is the role of the radiologist to think very carefully about whether that imaging is definitely required. Will it make a tangible difference to the patient's management? If it won't, then don't do it. Right. Let's conclude our discussion by talking about a few points you raise about artificial intelligence potential in medical imaging. One of the quotes that really stuck out to me is this. You say, there would certainly seem to be room for improvement in terms of human performance. Computers would not be required to take regular viral antigen tests, which is a very timely uh, consideration to the COVID pandemic, being incapable of contracting a viral infection, or at least not ones communicable to humans. Likewise, line managers would be impressed by the lack of sick days or need for annual leave and no dip in performance just before lunch or at the end of the day, even when fighting fit, fed and watered and after a good night's sleep, human radiologists remain prone to a wide range of potential sources of bias and error. But then you go on to say that AI still has some issues in terms of potential bias because AI inputs are still based on human input. AI often still needs to be checked by humans to make sure it's working properly and is not missing unexpected findings that it is not programmed to detect. And you conclude, as yet, the algorithms have not put me out of a job. Truly in the history of medical imaging, will there be a future day when you think AI is capable of functioning independent of human interpreters? So I think we're quite a long way off that at the moment the foreseeable future by which I'd been, you know, the next 20 or 30 years, I think human radiologists are going to continue to be looking at images and they may have lots of help in looking at those images provided by software algorithms. We'll get increasing input prov provided by software algorithms alongside the more kind of traditional role of, of radiologists still looking at the images. 
going a bit further into the future, and this is something I'm sort of speculate, um, you know, perhaps a little um, imaginatively in, in the book, you know, we, we, we may get to a point where scanners can come up with information that healthcare providers are looking for, but without necessarily generating images. I mean, if, if we think of how an, an MRI scanner works, there's this sort of laborious process of converting data in case space into images that are actually make sense to the human visual system. If the computers are clever enough at it, that they can just provide us with the answers that we're, we're needing without this sort of intermediate step of producing the images, then that seems like a sort of a, a logical conclusion. And presumably by this point, you know, the radiation doses are so incredibly low um, and the scan is conducted in a way that it is a minor inconvenience to the patient that we could just be kind of screening asymptomatic patients on a population level. And in that situation, if, if we're kind of in the business of asking the computer's questions rather than waiting to see images of the body, you know, what sort of questions might we be asking the computers? And the kind of things I'd, I'd think about is how can we help people live longer? How can people lead healthier lives and um, increase their quality of life? And then I kind of point out that actually, we know the answers to these questions already. We need clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, good quality food, don't smoke, don't drink, and um, get plenty of exercise. And that actually, you know, we don't need to wait for these super advanced scanners of the future to tell us this information. We, we're, we're empowered <laughs> with the information already. Perhaps we need to think about uh, a re-emphasis on preventative action rather than very high-tech, high-energy consumption, downstream imaging solutions for things that we, we really have the, the power to, to prevent. Right. You stake a claim for the phrase imaging industrial complex. What is this in your own words? So uh, many of your uh, listeners will be familiar with um, the military industrial complex that Eisenhower alluded to and then gained, gained a lot of prominence in, in the movie JFK as a, as a possible rationale for the kind of conspiracy theories related to JFK's assassination. More recently, there's the prison industrial complex where increasing concern that the judicial system is sort of fixed to make money out of um, people keep keeping people in, in prison. I would point out that Im imaging is not <laughs> quite in the same league of notoriety as those examples, but the point that I make in the book is that really any human activity conducted on an industrial scale, as medical imaging is, will tend to have patterns of behaviour that are, are sort of self-promoting, and, and it's very difficult to reduce uh, the amount of imaging that's done. And we sort of touched on that in this element of, you know, if you've got other modalities available that might give you a, a little bit more reassurance or certainty about a patient's diagnosis, you're going to be tempted to use them. And the cumulatively tests that were traditionally used in, in a very sort of selective problem solving fashion, over time, there's the sort of mission creep way where, where it ends up being used as a screening tool I sort of talk about the use of CT to diagnose appendicitis, which you know historically was a more of a clinical diagnosis. You know, you can certainly construct an argument that that's a appropriate use of imaging, but the general trend is that we use more and more imaging, and there is is a sort of a self sustaining pattern of activity that means that doing less becomes unthinkable. But perhaps that is something that we do need to think about, particularly in the context of knowing that the carbon footprint or, or carbon mortality cost, if you like, of healthcare in general and medical imaging uh, specifically does pose a risk to human health. I want to close the interview by sharing one of my favorite quotes from your book, which is found in the end. You say, medical images... Despite some of the associated difficulties I have highlighted, do save many, many lives. Seen in this light, they can claim to be among the most powerful images ever produced by humanity. Yet their power also resides in belonging within the broader tradition of representing the body. Indeed, medicine has long been characterized as an art as well as a science, and medical imaging certainly has a foot planted firmly in both camps. I just want to thank you for writing such an interesting, often highly thought-provoking and very sincere book. I've only scratched the surface of what is in this book in this interview with you. For example, I have not included most of the artistic references pertaining to painting, sculpture, as well as films that you have included in the book that are very interesting with tie-ins to what we are currently doing in medical imaging. Your book has certainly inspired me to imagine imaging in new ways.
I think you've summarized it very nicely, Matt. And th thank you ever so much for your kind words on the book and for the opportunity to discuss it with you today. It's been a pleasure. Are you on social media so my audience can get in touch with you or follow you there? Yes. The Twitter link is at I I underscore art underscore book. Excellent. There's an art gallery in Park City, Utah, a short drive from where I live, that features the work of Nick VC, who I've read as a British photographer who works primarily with images created from x-rays. I understand he has a lot of x-ray art in the UK as well. And he literally uses x-rays purely as an artistic medium and not for medical diagnosis, x-raying things like cars, motorcycles, and airplanes. If you are ever in the Salt Lake City area, please let me know and we can go check out this art gallery together. And if I'm in Scotland in the next few years, I may be getting in touch. Fantastic. Thanks for that. That'd be grand. Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment. 